Okay. All right. Great. Thanks so much, everyone. Um, <clears throat> we have a couple curriculum leaders joining us today for our uh, first agenda item, Kelly Del Vecchio, as you know, our K2 uh, CIL for math, and Patty Powers is here as we talk about the PE curriculum renewal. Um, so we're going to uh, start with math, and it's obviously been a theme all year long. This is, uh, we have an adoption uh, that we're bringing before you um, for review and then ultimately for adoption by the full board at the uh, June meeting, which is uh, a week away on June 14th. So uh, Kelly's going to run through, um, she has all the results of the pilot and uh, as you know, uh, we've had uh, math in focus uh, throughout our K-8 system, but this year we looked at in kindergarten um, at augmenting uh, that program. We felt there was some room to improve there. The, the curriculum we looked at was methodology. And so we had two teachers conduct a pilot, as you know, and uh, very very positive results. Kelly's going to sort of give you an overview of that and then, um, you know, get into the details of the adoption. So, Kelly, you want to take it away? I know you have a presentation that was posted for all to see. Yep. Hi, good morning, everybody. Um, I'm going to share, um, I'm going to do a whole window and see if that works. But please let me know if you're not seeing it the right way. Do you see the whole screen? Uh, starting. Yep. Yep. Okay. So I guess this is the hard part is that I can't see any of you. So uh, if you need me or need to say anything, I can't see you. Um, okay. So like Ken said, we um, looked at a program called Mathodology Developing Roots. And this is our proposal for kindergarten for going forward for next year. Um, so I just wanted to look you know, criteria wise, what we've been looking at is, is it well aligned with the content and practice standards for the Connecticut Common Core math standards? Um, does it support our district goals and our school goals? Is it developmentally appropriate and engaging and hands on? Um, will we be developing all the foundational skills for where we know our students need to go and move on? Um, does it provide differentiation for our students? Is there enough teacher support uh, so these were some of the criteria that we used um, in, in picking this program. Um, the research comes not from me, but it came from Carolyn Benton, who was the CIL last year in the past. And like Ken said, math and focus is uh, the grades one through eight <clears throat> when we adopted the 2020 edition this year. We kind of took the opportunity to look at kindergarten and there were some things with kindergarten that we loved still about math and focus but it's very workbook driven and we just wanted to see is there something else out there that might be better for them uh, so that led us also to this program so in singapore there is no kindergarten so math, math and focus created a kindergarten developing with the same standards and pedagogy to create a kindergarten program. Um, so we looked into this, it's more, the author of this program is, had the Montessori background uh, and she'd look to bridge that Montessori pedagogy or background with into our Singapore math and felt that this was something that we should look really deeply in and we really liked it. So we had two pilot classrooms happening um, and they we had training over the summer from the writer and they had in two classes, full pilot. Um, they used this program solely, no math and focus or really no other supplementation at all was needed. Um, I myself was able to attend um, a coaching corner every month with the writer, which was so wonderful because we had questions and teachers had questions and we wanted to know where to go and she, it was wonderful. Um, so let's go on to methodology. So the background of this is 
it is seamlessly transitions us into our Singapore math pedagogy going forward. So that was a big, important concept there that we weren't doing something different that we we're going to have to undo or redo or anything. <laughs> but we know math is best taught through the concrete pictorial and abstract. So it's well aligned with that. Um, students are exploring, they're connecting to their real world, they're collaborating with each other. She calls it purposeful play. Um, they love it. They think it's fun. So they're learning math in pure joy as they're doing it, their exploration. And it's all while maintaining that pedagogy. So while we use the word play, it's they're really not just playing. They're, it's really purposeful. Um, the language they're developing, the communication through the students has been phenomenal. And it's developing their math skills and it's explaining how they got it and why it works and really, really building this great mathematical background. It still has the same pentagonal framework. It's built all around problem solving. Um, it fosters a positive attitude and they try things, they're active, they have tasks, they take risks. Uh, so it really is a solid background um, development in kindergarten. It has plenty of resources. The teachers each have two teacher's guides. It has a really strong lesson structure with exploration, usually like an anchor task. Um, they do a lot of practicing. It's in small groups, it's in whole groups. Uh, then they move on to some reflection where they're doing things more independently. Uh, they might be turning and talking to a friend and explaining. They're doing some work in writing in their think pads. They're questioning things. So it really has a strong, solid lesson basis too, which is essential for that 45 minutes they have to do math to really have a solid math block, which is important. Um, the students are on the right hand side. They have their think pads, which is not a workbook, but it is something that the individual students have to write in. It's a place for them to record their thinking and their reflection. And it's used a lot for screening for the teachers to for them to see where their students are. A big part of this program is meeting students where they are. And as we know, kindergartners come in with quite a range of places. So it's really helpful in that sense. It's also used for assessment as the year goes on. Um, they have playing, they have cards that you'll see on the right. So they see things in a variety of ways, very colorful, very engaging. On the left hand side, it shows like the number four and it shows it in, you know, the, the numeral four in a tens frame for tally marks and, you know, different illustrations. So they see things in a variety of ways. Um, and it it provides a lot of opportunity for these students to collaborate and work together. One of the great things about this program is they have something called shelf days and they have a series of lessons that they go through and then they kind of take a break and they have a shelf day it's called and these shelves are built throughout the year and they contain uh, games and activities and practice that they've done so far that they can continue to use and they also might have something you know from to build on but it is so welcoming and they're available and the students choose to do them even when they have free time or indoor recess they ask if they could do these math games so they're very um, engaging for them to me this is a is a huge strength. Most math programs that we've used in the past, the online support has really just been a digital copy of the teacher's manual and the, the print materials. This program offers a tremendous amount of online support. So a couple of the different icons have, you know, they have a teacher's toolkit and it really goes through almost like an online professional development for individual teachers. The coaching corner in the middle is what I spoke about, was a monthly meeting that was available to curriculum leaders. And if if interested, teachers could often attend, but it's right smack dab in the middle of the day. So I usually brought their questions and then met with them afterwards. Um, it The top on the right over here talks about like really some foundational math and program success. So that has organizing your materials and your lesson format and what are the core competencies and assessments. 
it shows the four chapters. There's four major chapters, number being chapter one, whereas in Math and Focus, um, there's a day, a lesson on the number one, and there's a lesson on number two, and so forth. And this chapter one is number, and it it goes as high as the students can go. So it is so organically differentiates for them, it's wonderful. Chapters two and three, measurement and geometry is really hands-on in the middle of the year while they continue to build all of that number sense that they've started the year off with. And then at the end of the year, we go into their operations. And these students are doing amazing. They're putting numbers together and telling stories about numbers and um, doing really advanced uh, problem solving with their numbers. It's great. And then the, at the very bottom where it says topic one counting sequence, every single topic that they have on here has these sections that have videos and downloads and links and seesaw and pictures in the gallery. And they have videos of Sarah, the writer, like teaching a little mini lesson. It might be like two or three minutes. It might be 10 minutes. They have downloads of what student samples. So it's really offered us a lot of um, calibration with what's happening in the program to make sure are we doing this to the best of our ability or what more could we be doing. Um, it has a ton of links. So everything that she gathers as she's going and growing, this is is up here. So there's a ton of support out there. She also has a great Facebook group that all the teachers are in and every day teachers are putting up something great. Um, so our teachers, and this is through, I'd like to say that this is also through all of our COVID restrictions that we had this year, um, that the teachers love it. They said it was so developmentally appropriate and the, everything it had to offer was really a positive. I'm not going to read through all of those things, but those were, you know, a, just a survey I did with teachers and asked them a variety of questions, what I've consolidated to what they're actually saying about the program, which I think speaks volumes. I think one of the strongest things is the differentiation. And like I said, it, it really prides itself on meeting students where they are. So if a student needs more or is in either direction, high or low, it's really there for them. And it's really part of the program. So it's not like teachers are trying to come up with something else or pulling from things. It really goes as deep as we can go with the concepts. And the assessment piece is really formative. It's summative. It's happening all day. It's not like a test at the at the end of the chapter and then close the book up. So that is some teacher feedback. This is my favorite slide. I was going to end with this one, but I guess I got to get to the business first. But this is um, this is what our kids look like during math. You know, they're engaged with partners. They're thinking hard individually. They're participating in whole class lessons. They're creating. They're doing things in a variety of tactile and concrete ways. Uh, they move to the very abstract and they're writing number sentences and illustrating their thinking. And all year long, all of these concepts are being developed. So it differs in the sense that it's not like a chapter, close the book, chapter, close the book. It's really something that all year these concepts continue to grow. So this is my favorite slide of all of that. And they just are loving it. Here is the the financial aspect of it. So what we did was we looked at the methodology or do we want to stay with math and focus, the 2020 edition as we did through first through eighth. So our initial cost for the first year of methodology is higher only because we have to purchase all of the teacher bundles. Um, and then moving forward, the cost goes down because we only need to supplement as we need and and purchase the um, consumables for the stu each student over the years. But I looked at the six year subscription for Math and Focus as we have done with the other grades and the cost over the six years, there's really no cost effect um, to help to make our decision harder or easier. Um, and yeah, this was just the other day when I was in math with them and asking them, you know, what do you love? Like, what do you really like? And these are all the things they said. And it's embedded in their activities, but it really comes out to what are they doing? They they know they're doing math. They know they're figuring things out. They know that they're doing hard math and it's all still very exciting to them. So I thank you for your support and I'll come back to see you. And if you have any questions, let me know.
Looks great. I love the Montessori piece where the kids are really playing and learning the math. That sounds great. It really is. Yeah. Have you spoken or had any of the first grade teachers take a look at the curriculum to see what they'll have the students coming in with as a base? And do they have any reactions from that group? So it's come up in a couple different conversations because often in like one concept in first grade that has been early on in the beginning of the year is called number bonds. I'm not sure if you're familiar with those, but um, number bonds is a is a pretty um, heavy concept for these kids to realize that you can break down numbers and, and be flexible with numbers. And this program has them doing number bonds already in kindergarten. So they were excited to hear about certain skills and kind of foundational pieces that they're coming in with. They were like, oh, wow, they're doing that already in kindergarten. You know, so I, I would anticipate that they are coming in. They're going to be surpri pleasantly surprised with some of the things that those students received that they haven't in the past. Um, materials wise, no, the teachers haven't looked at the materials. It's just come up more so in as we talk about concepts with first grade or second grade that I'm able to talk about, you know, what we, we're anticipating for the next years with the new program. And then if you're moving away from the workbook, which I think is so exciting to be able to do all these manipulatives, mm -hmm. how does that affect um, the ability to do assessments of the kids? So in the think pads, it's very open-ended and students are asked to, you know, show their numbers in different ways and, illustrate their thinking. I think it's really building, you know, so much of the older kids have a hard time with showing their math thinking. That phrase is sometimes difficult. And how do you show what's going on in your brain? And I feel like this program allows them to really develop that, putting their thinking down on paper versus, you know, just filling in the blanks of a problem. With that said, um, there is plenty of opportunity for us to really start that foundation of having them do that work. But in the past, all kindergarten assessments have always been done one-on-one, -on -one, orally interviewed with them. So even still, it really, we've been still used the same assessment piece this year just to compare apples to apples all year. Um, so the assessment is really done one-on-one -on -one with all kindergarten students. Some kids can write and fill in the blanks and do the workbook, and some kids really can't. So it's really where they are. Sounds good. Thanks. I, I have a, usually a pretty standard set of questions I ask. Okay. Um, when we talked about new curriculum stuff and startup costs and ongoing costs. And, mm -hmm. um, so it's kind of, I have two questions. The first is um, what was the impetus for the change? It's opportunity. It was an opportunity. I feel like we were in math and focus. We used math and focus across the whole elementary level. Um, but when we had the opportunity to move to the new addition, where we felt like it was a continued to be a great fit for other grades, we thought, why not just look into some other things for kindergarten? Because Math and Focus has a great basis, but we found that kindergarten was doing a lot of supplementing. They were using a lot, you know, putting in their own centers and developing a lot more kind of homegrown to make it more engaging and go a little deeper. So if we're going to supplement and do all that, is there a program out there that maybe could offer that for us? So that was really just the opportunity to look there. Okay. And how long have we used the program that uh, you're looking to phase out? Math and Focus has yeah. been since 2013, I believe, was when it started. I wasn't CIL then, so I'm not positive that that was the year for kindergarten that they started, but it was around there. It's been here a long time. Okay. I don't know, Laura, is there a different, did, am I right or no? I don't know if it was here before I was. <clears throat> no, 2013. I started. I don't know if Ken, if you have that history. Yeah, no. In different grades started in different years because yeah, we phased it in. So uh, on or about, I can't remember off the top of my head, but on or about. So it's 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 been here a good, you know, eight to Nine, ten, ten years. years. Yeah. yeah. Good. And my last question of my standard set of questions is, uh, will there be an annual review? How often we go back and benchmark how the new program is working versus the old? Because I think really what it comes down to is at some point you're going to ask for the cost to be approved. Um, and for most of us, we obviously we rely on your expertise on the curriculum side. We have to justify or 
okay the cost so is there a, something in place that you can go back in a year or is there a plan to go back and review that this actual that this program actually has and you know you can go back to what you had versus what you are working with now so that we can see that it was a worthwhile investment and that we're you know the, the kids are benefiting from it yeah, so I can say with confidence that I think that the two teachers who rolled it out this year are really excited and confident that we're making the right decision to go as a grade level. Um, in that sense, we would only be purchasing it, you know, as a one year right now. It's not like it's math and focus, the six year subscription. So it's not like we have a huge commitment in the time there. But with spending the money the first year is obviously a huge investment. Um, that we would plan to, you know, use it for the couple of years till we can see how it works with the, you know, the future students. We have data-wise um, the ability to go back and look at what were, our, when did our kindergartners look like in the past? What do they look like now? What do the pilot classes look like compared to the math and focus classes? And then we can look at the grade level as a whole next year and the following year, how do our first graders phase into it and see their growth? So I would anticipate that we're going into it pretty confidently that this is a great decision and teachers, students, parents, feedback has been wonderful. Um, they say their kids love math, which is not always something you hear going down the line. You know, math turns into a sour subject at some points for some people. So they're saying my child loves math. So in kindergarten, we're really happy to build that um, foundation there for them. So I guess there'll be long-winded conversations. I think there's a lot of aspects to look at over different periods of time. And we have a historical piece to look back and forward with. So there will be uh, an annual look back. Here's what, how the program has I think so. Uh, I mean, I wouldn't be ready us. to throw it out after next year with the first year. I think we have to give programs a chance. Um, but yes, I would definitely think that we will have plenty of time for reflection throughout the year, at the end of the year, going into the new year, and in the years to come. And is that something that's formally presented, for example, to the curriculum committee? So when a new um, program is instituted, is you know you come to the curriculum committee for the approval, then the BOE for the financial approval. Is there is there a formal process that after the first year? There's a the curriculum committee, you know, the results to share with the curriculum committee to, to, to validate that it was a worthwhile investment and hear the tweaks that we're doing. Is that something that formally happens? You know, if I can speak a little bit to that, um, I think that, um, you know, this year we set up a very clear district action plan. And within the action plan, um, we had. Um, you know, district goals, school goals, individual teacher goals. And, and you know, it says I'm looking at the plan actually right now because I was I was updating it um, based on um, what Kelly was saying. You know, you, you have individual teacher goals focused on specific academic needs of students in the classroom. All of these teachers in the elementary schools focused on math this year. One of the action steps was to put in this new program, get it trained. And then next year, when we look at our district and school goals, it's going to again be, you know, at scale, the implementation of this program. So <laughs> I think that it's something that, that needs to be threaded into the curriculum um, subcommittee, as well as, you know, mid-year and at the end of the year, if we pre are presenting the um, progress, if you will, and the evidence indicators of success on our goals formally at the board meeting, these kinds of questions, I think, naturally should come up and, and um, I would encourage them coming up as well as in the budget process, because it all has to be vertically articulated and we have to keep reporting out on how the, you know, what is the academic return on investment for these programs? Um, so, you know, um, that's kind of the plan. I know next week we're going to be giving a, a brief overview of, again, the status in June. This is one of the areas we would um, speak to. And then next year, not to speak for Laura Caddis, but when you have a program being implemented at scale in kindergarten, that is a major focus with those teachers. And there will be I would say multiple um, evidence indicators of success. You know, you have the qualitative, you have the quantitative, and then as you you go along and, and you look at how the students are progressing, um, you know, it ties back kind of uh, to this foundation we're trying to give them. So I hope I'm not too long-winded, but I want 
Um, I just wanted to make sure that the committee knew that that all of these are linked. Like I'm editing right now the district goals document as Kelly's talking because I need to capture the importance of of that work and then where we're going to be going um, moving forward. Yeah, I think that's the basis of my question is that it's great that we're not staying with programs that are stagnant and that we're adapting and changing based on what's available today. But like you said, there, ha there should be an academic return on investment. And, um, you know, that's, I think, something that's very valuable to be able to have that kind of feedback, that the program is working, it was worthwhile investment, because it makes it easier next time another self comes and says, hey, I'd like to revamp this program. And so I think the, that's, that's the basis of my question. We're just throwing money in the wind and saying, hey, you know, it's 2022 or something new, but that's not the case. We're looking back to say this program has been successful, this program is good, but needs to be tweaked, or hey, this program it was a great idea, but it didn't come to fruition, so let's move on. Just had one more quick question. Um, thinking about rolling it out to the teachers, and is it going to be, a, is it a big massive change in terms of PD, and how does that fit in with their schedule, with everything else the kindergarten teachers are doing next year? How do they feel about that adjustment? I would say they're excited. Um, math hasn't changed in a long time. They haven't had a lot of the math PDs for this. Um, however, I feel like it really builds on what we have done with math and focus, you know, so the pedagogy, the concrete pictorial abstract, the hands on uh, all of those are really the same, you know, so it's not teaching new math to them. Uh, it's different resources. It's also a different, um, you know, the the rolling out and continuous and the spiraling of concepts they're really excited about. Um, versus doing a chapter on shapes and then, you know, maybe something about shapes will continue to come up, but it's really a continuous, they're really excited about those concepts because kids are going to develop at all different times during the year and they want to continue to continue to visit them and let them grow with them. Even if they're mastering where a kindergartner should be in the fall with a concept, they still can take them deeper throughout the year. So they're really excited about, about that spiral piece. And we have some in-house um, professional development opportunities available for teachers with the writer coming to our school to work with them and get them all set up. Um, Patty and Bree and I definitely have the year in our back pocket to you know, work around there for my professional development purposes in-house. Uh, so there's a lot of opportunity there. And I believe that kindergarten does not have another any big change for next year so when we did meet with kindergarten teachers to have this conversation you know one of them did say you know are we implementing anything else huge and new in kindergarten so that this could really be a math year for them awesome great great, great. thank you kelly and i know that yeah. uh, that emphasis on professional development will be there all through the year to support the teachers which um which is one of the benefits of your role and having you dedicated to Pearlbutt. So we're, we're thrilled about that. So thank you for the, um, the update, you, Laura. Did, you, did anything you need to add here, Laura, or before we move on? Or uh, No, I think Kelly covered it all. You know, we've, we've already started talking through plans for next year about how to support the teachers, professional development time, and, you know, rolling it all out. So great. Okay. All right, so then moving along, um, we have our second agenda item, and it is an update on the PE curriculum renewal. And we have a curriculum renewal cycle uh, for physical education that has been well underway. The research and development phases of uh, that renewal have taken place. Uh, Patty is here to provide an update. Uh, on the key shifts that, uh, you know, and, and, you know, whenever we're in a curriculum renewal, it may be, you know, we need to make some tweaks or maybe a uh, big overhaul. Uh, I think this kind of falls somewhere in the middle, Patty, and you can kind of, you know, uh, share, you know, where the key um, shifts are that the department is looking to make K-12 uh, in enhancing our physical education program, which as we know is so critical because, um, exercise boosts brain power uh, as they move back into their, their classroom environment. 
from physical education. It does, um, you know, kind of shift, uh, shift their brains a bit to reorient them to the classroom. So, Patty. Good morning, everybody. I'm going to share with you a presentation. Let me do that now. Okay, I should be at the beginning of that though, sorry. Okay, so um, we've been, as Ken said, working on this for a few years now. The pandemic kind of happened in the middle of our renewal. So, and then we did also have a lot of um, just changes we had to make due to the, like the hygiene issues and you know, proximity issues. So PE was definitely affected um, a lot by the changes that we've had to make over the few years. Um, just to let you know that everything, our work is really based on uh, the guidelines and the frameworks from Shape America, which is like the National Organization for Health and Physical Education, as well as CAFERD, which this is pretty important because the state of Connecticut just adopted new healthy balanced living curriculum frameworks that we have guided some of our, our work upon as well. Um, our goal here is to develop physically literate individuals and what that entails is um, making sure our students have the skills necessary to participate in a variety of physical activities. They understand the benefits involved. They participate regularly in physical activity and very importantly, they value physical activity and its contributions to a healthful lifestyle. Um, again, the Shape American National Standards, there's five that we based our work upon. Um, without reading them to you in word for word. They're focused upon motor skills and movement patterns, concepts, principles, strategies, tactics, uh, health enhancing um, their level of physical activity and fitness, uh, responsible social behavior, um, respecting self and others, and of course, health enjoyment, uh, self-expression and social, social interaction that you get from physical activity. Uh, the process, how we went about this, was we use something called the PCAT analysis tool, and that stands for Physical Education Curriculum Analysis Tool. And it's created from Shape America, and it allows um, directors and whoever's creating the curriculums to really uh, use the standards and the grade level outcomes, compare it to what you're currently doing. It helps you to identify uh, strengths and weaknesses and then from that information, we use that data to inform us. Uh, we created um, essential questions and enduring understandings. And then the real backbone of what our work was based upon was we created a pretty extensive K-12 scope and sequence document, which I will share with you in a minute. Um, the scope and sequence really focused on every grade, the content and the skills, what we want students to be able to do at the end of each of our units per grade level. Then of course we updated Atlas and with our newly created units, we still have you know work and revising and new things to add there. So that's pretty exciting as well. And you know, our curriculum is a working document and our next focus is going to be uh, heavy, heavy, heavily based upon uh, assessments. Um, just where we are at PE wise in the district, Hurlbut has PE twice a week for 30 minutes. At the WIS 3.5, we are twice a week for 40. Middle school, high school, it's an every other day scenario. Um, we were at 43 minutes this year at the middle school. Next year, we'll be at 53. And high school, 9 and 10 have it for a full semester, and 11 and 12 for a quarter. Our focus at each level, foundational skills, elementary, that would be K-5. Middle school, application of those skills. And of course, at the high school, um, a love for a lifetime lifetime activities and to be able to uh, be physically fit uh, when they are a graduate of Weston High School. Uh, do they participate regularly in physical activity? Do they understand the connection between physical activity, uh, their um, emotional learning or emotional strengths and their uh, social strengths? And, you know, basically, can they design and create um, a routine or a workout uh, regimen that benefits them and is personal to them. Um, some notable curricular changes. Some of these have been piloted. Some of these we are working toward. 
uh, more personalized instruction, uh, more technology and digital learning incorporated. And that doesn't mean in the classroom uh, itself. It could be like a flipped classroom approach, um, reflecting after a unit or an experience in Google Classroom or Canvas or Seesaw. Uh, choice infused throughout. Uh, again, making it a little more personal for students uh, that's better connected to the national standards. We spent lots of time analyzing the um, grade level outcomes and making sure that we had uh, we were aligned with that. Um, an increase in social emotional learning. It's more fitness based. Um, something that I'm passionate about is incorporating more family community involvement. And that's taking what they are learning in school and bringing it home. Um, at home, maybe, uh, you know, researching things that they can't do in school. I'll talk a little bit more about that in a minute. And then again, more emphasis outside of school fitness. Here's the scope and sequence I was referring to. This is actually like a 28 page document. And we went through obviously here, starting with K all the way through 12 and, um, it really highlighted the content and more importantly, the, the skills, what we want them to be able to do at the end of each of those units. And they, you know, are aligned vertically. And if you looked at throwing and catching, which is an example here, you know, when they went up to one, it would be a little bit more mature than it would be at K. And then I created a skill and concept map. And this really looks at every skill that we focus on K-12 and where it's introduced, where um, skills are emerging, maturing, and then um, finally applying where students are applying them regularly. Um, a little bit about fitness testing, which is really important to us. Uh, here in Weston, we test from grades three through 10. Um, the results in grades four, six, and eight, and as well as one year in high school are reported to the state. Uh, we saw a significant dip in our aerobic endurance results last year as a result of the pandemic. And um, we did make a, some instructional changes this year. We saw growth in some levels and not as much in others. So this will be a continued focus for us next year and looking forward to sharing some of the uh, strategies that we used in the areas that we were successful here. Uh, this is the family, communi family and community connections I was talking about. Um, family involvement in at-home activities, an example of that was I had an, we had an extra credit like enrichment opportunity where students um, were researching hiking opportunities in the area, um, some extra, extra uh, enrichment opportunities where they created a, a hiking log with their family and they submitted back a photo. That's just one example. Others, other examples were researching alternative things that were not like sport related. You do not have to be an athlete to be physically fit. And we really want all of our students um, to understand that and, and understand that they can really reap the benefits of fitness, even if they're not interested in traditional sports. So that we had one uh, task where they had to um, investigate like a, something different, something alternative, like examples were mountain biking or um, rowing or martial arts or horseback riding. So there was there was probably like 15 to 20 different things that students were researching and then did a little um, share out with their classmates. And project adventure is very big for us. Um, this was something that we had to put on hold during the pandemic. It's about collaboration, cooperation, working together very closely. We did see this year that uh, the students had a much more difficult time at the beginning of this unit working together. And we really did persevere. That's a project venture quality. <laughs> and um, we stuck with it and then we did notice a change at the end. And uh, through reflection, we saw that, you know, they did, there was learning and skill transfer that occurred, but it, it was, it was difficult, more difficult than usual. So we're, we're really going to, you know, hang in there with this and try to come up with some strategies to perhaps incorporate it a little earlier in the year for them um, and to really look at how we scaffold it 9-12. And then again, I did allude to this, the technology and digital learning. Um, it's, it's again for reinforcement of the learning or introducing learning before it happens. And I'm finding that it's a great platform 
for students to personalize what they're doing in the classroom and to like set personal goals for themselves and it, it really a good opportunity for them to reflect also afterward. And I saw some you know promising uh, results with this. So I'd like to, to keep sharing with um, staff of how, what I did and what some of my uh, peers did and share it with the whole department. So um, we can share it, you know, really make an impact across the whole district, not just at some levels. Uh, challenges that we are still working on um, we're looking at really increasing the amount of moderate to vigorous physical activity in all physical education classes, uh, encouraging all students K-12 to get 60 minutes per day, uh, supporting this through uh, extra enrichment and again, family connection activities. Uh, next year will be a big focus on assessments, uh, creating new experiences that will you know, inform us as to you know, what our students are able to do, like a pre-assessment or a check-in. Um, and then, you know, developing our units from there and then reflection afterwards to see how we how we did, how students are doing. Um, training some teachers with, you know, increased use of technology, uh, you know, meeting teachers where they're at and then supporting them to, you know, feel comfortable to incorporate some of these new strategies. Um, time is always, always a, a problem. Everybody would probably tell you the same thing as well as um, scheduling. We did have some teachers that are split between schools and sometimes planning is uh, difficult with multiple preps and travel time, et cetera. So I am going to stop sharing. I think I stopped sharing and come back. And I'd love to answer all your questions. I hope that was informative for you. That was great, thank you. Um, I'm really interested in this idea of increasing the assessments. And I understand that on one level, the purpose of the assessments is kind of on a holistic scale. How can we improve the program? How do those assessments work on an individual scale? So you have a handful of kids who are, I don't know, I saw one of the things in ki kindergarten on that um, Excel sheet was uh, like muscular strength, push-ups and curl-ups. So if you have someone who just doesn't have muscular strength. If it was a, a subject area, we might have them have like an extra pullout group or support. What do you do with students that fall short of a particular benchmark? Um, how do you address it? So what that was, you gave a kindergarten example, but I can give an example of what I did at the middle school. So as far as like, let's say an example you just gave, well, the fitness testing. So at, during our fitness unit, um, we did First, the first thing we did was we analyzed our data from last year. And from there, students can identify their strengths and their weaknesses. And we did like a pre-assessment with the fitness testing. So given your example, like if someone can't do any push-ups, So part of that experience was, okay, we, this is my, my problem area. And so this is what my focus is going to be for this unit. And then we had different resources for the particular areas that needed improvement and then students would create their own personal plan for that area of focus for example we could very well have a student that's weak in all of the areas but more commonly it's they have one or two weak areas and so their focus for that unit is going to be on that particular weakness rather than you know, they don't, perhaps they don't need to focus on their aerobic endurance because they already run a seven minute mile. So it's definitely personalized to what their area of, um, you know, improvement needs to be. And then we, we had like formative uh, check-ins along the way. And then at the end, we, they analyzed their, their data of the, of the actual assessment. And then they reflected again with, you know, this is why this this did not get better. Or this is why this did improve. And this is what I'm going to do next time. So that was something that we I piloted here at the middle school, shared it with my colleagues here. And I really want to, to spread that out to the whole district for next year. And that same, you know, concept can be applied to, you know, a child that is having trouble uh, stepping with the opposite foot when they throw or um, it could be, at, you know, at the foundational level, K-5, it's really, you know, a lot of locomotor movements, you know, gross motor movements, things like that. So, you know, we, I can't tell you how many students that come up to the middle school and they 
still can't throw properly. And um, they might have been able to do it a little bit, but when they when it was the time that they focused on it at the whist or the hurl, but but it's repeated. They have to continue to do these. And sometimes they don't make the connections of why it's important to have like a fine motor skill, you know, and we'll talk about, you know, you're walking in with groceries and then you trip, like, do you have the dexterity to catch yourself or, you know, why would it be dangerous to, you know, fall on your face? <laughs> but it's, um, it's, they, they kind of start making the real world connections there with why some of those little things that they never consider to be very important, you know, can Be very no, that was that was great. And and looking at the challenges that you're looking at addressing, a lot of them look like um, team based in house. So you're meeting together, you're planning, you're working on the curriculum. Are there any areas where you foresee needing equipment or things that come at an external expense or or trainers coming in, um, or is it at the stage right now where most of it is just done in house? Most of it is in house. We do. Project Adventure does come at a cost because we do have to stay current with the training. Um, that is something that we are getting two people advanced trained this summer, and then we have to stay current with that. So that's usually an every other year thing. And that trainer, when they come in, we refresh our skills and they bring new experiences to us as well. So that's one thing that we definitely need to make sure we maintain and stay, stay current with. We're working on all of the facilities projects coming forward in many of the buildings. Are there any big facility needs that you see that would greatly impact the PE program or what we could possibly offer? Uh, facility wise, yes. The, the gymnasium at the K2 school is not conducive for um, physical education really. It's a small room and it's not ventilated well and there's not air conditioning in there or in the the middle school gymnasiums um so that that does pose a problem sometimes like for example now like the new gym here could be almost 90 degrees so when we're not able to go outside it's difficult to do certain activities in there so um i think the WIS has a wonderful situation going on they have you know an air-conditioned gym that's nice and you know, nice big closet. The high school has plenty of space and turf fields and two gymnasiums. Um, but as far as, you know, the other two schools, definitely some updating there would, would benefit our program. I, I think it's worth noting, yes, definitely the ventilation in, in the gyms. The high school gym is the second one is not air conditioned. Um, however, it's true that because we're all on one road, I mean, I, I saw middle schoolers walking over that they can avail themselves of these turf fields and everything else, as do the uh, WIS, where they have the, uh, you know, all the field days are out there. So I, I would say that that is a plus. That's a huge plus for us. And it's, it actually develops a lot of community. It's nice to be able to to walk to the high school to use their facilities. It's nice that you know sometimes the high school students are outside on our fields, and everybody seems to like that. So, and it's like and, and yeah, and the middle school has the pool. It also is. How is the uh, training room there? There's a training room at the middle school, correct? That was uh, the brainchild of the middle school uh, PE teachers on the old stage or something. Yes, it's here. It's being, uh, it needs updating when the swim program is actually uh, purchasing treadmills for us because they use the the room during the winter and they were kind of, you know, becoming outdated. So currently Matt Medvey is sort of coordinating with them on that, but they did just remove all of our treadmills and the plan is for them to give us new ones. Um, Where are we getting the new ones? I'm sorry. The, the Weston swim program. Oh, because we have to make sure, just to give Matt a heads up, that there's a formal um, gift made to the Board of Ed. That's a considerable amount of, of funding. Um, so if you could help facilitate that, that's wonderful. Okay. Um, and as far as what's up there, it's perfectly fine for our middle school needs. It's just a matter of having making sure the... You know, it's always a challenge too to make that gets uh, inspected and maintained every year as well, just to make sure ensure the safety. 
Yeah, that, that's actually another teaching station. So you have two gyms plus that station. So it gives you three three yeah. spaces to work with when you have multiple classes. And the pool during the winter mm -hmm. months. The swimming was an area that we did not get to do. Um, and just now, uh, students are getting in the pool for the past week. And it was an option. It wasn't a requirement. And there's activities going on in the pool, but it, it's not swim instruction like we usually do. And we can tell they have not had swim instruction. So um, it's, you know, it's an area that's really important to be able to be proficient at. And some of our students, and I don't think it's just here in Weston, there's a lot of, you know, when kids were little, they did gymnastics and swimming until they were five, and then they transferred into sports. And now sports has started at three. So there's more to do and swimming gets put, you know, I think they get made to be water safe and then that's it. You know, um, one thing that I found interesting, and I think that it would it bears some reflection, um, is, you know, when I taught at the elementary school, um, swimming started in uh, third and fourth grade, and right. we used to bring them up there. I mean, when I'm thinking that our program is in sixth grade, perhaps that's something that we we should think about uh, at the WIST. The kids loved it. They took the bus up, and they were that much younger. Um, and we noticed the difference when that stopped as well. So, you know, when they come in in grade six, sixth grade, I would love to have them longer in the pool or at least for a designated period of time and then a differentiation after that. We would offer almost free swim instructions for um, kids that we did identify for a few years. But again, you know, it's you're doing a football flag football unit. There's there's fine motor skills and gross motor skills that you gain from that. But, you know, you can exist in your life if you're not that good at throwing a football. But if you uh, aren't very good at swimming, it can be a problem. And it often, you know, even aside from the safety part of it, it's, you know, there's people, adults that avoid certain things because they're not comfortable around the water. So it's, I, I think it's really important. It's a thing that and we're very lucky to have the pool here and, mm -hmm. Yeah. You know, it does. T I will admit it takes a lot of there's a lot of um, planning that goes into it. And, you know, you have to worry about uh, issues that occur and making sure there's supervision. And so there's there's a lot that goes into it. But I do think it's worth the work and the the effort. And something else while I have you that we're going to be focusing on next year is um, and the state is actually focusing on this, is grading practices in physical education and really making sure that students are being assessed on, you know, physical skills, what they're able, I shouldn't even say that, what they're able to do, their investment toward the growth of those physical skills more specifically, and not just that they, you know, they're prepared in pro proper clothing and they're not a behavior problem. You know, PE is a, is a, a very um, intense area to supervise. So there's a lot going on. There's a lot of movement happening. And, you know, it is something that um, it's a little shift in, in a focus of, you know, using technology, uh, providing different types of assignments. And so there's, there's definite training and, um, resources and research that we need to do just to um, make sure we're in line with, you know, current grading practices and what is best practice for us. Okay. All right. So, <clears throat> Patty, thank you for the update and the hard work uh, with the department. I know it's uh, it's been stretched over three three years when this is normally you know, a two year process uh, to get to this point. So now continued implementation, evaluation, refinement, and uh, further update to the board as we move along. Perfect. Thank okay. you. All right. You're welcome. Thank you. Um, let's see, Laura, you're still, okay. Um, I need to just, if you don't mind, Bernie, if I could shuffle the agenda to, um, because I know Laura has to leave sure. at 10 o'clock. The, uh, the discussion of uh, comprehensive literacy, 
program because we know that um, you know reading has been in the news, and it's been um, uh, you know the subject of several articles, debates, and you know for for many years, um, you know there's always been this conversation uh, regarding you know phonics and whole language approach and balanced literacy. We hear those terms thrown around a lot. And, um, you know, we see, uh, you know, in the news uh, articles regarding uh, re regarding those subjects and teachers college. Uh, so, I, you know, I, I know you had questions and I thought, um, you know, we could start here, um, as you suggested, and, you know, really bring it down to the Weston level in terms of, you know, where are we and, and uh, you know, any of these conversations that are happening you know, uh, nationally and uh, locally affect us um, in, in terms of our approach. And we've heard from, you know, Alex and Andrea with some recent updates. You, you know, we've uh, we've we've made some some shifts of our own uh, with reading. Although, uh, although I think there that we do need to have a, a comprehensive update at, at, at some point um, soon as well. But to kind of begin the begin the discussion here, frame it um, so. Kind of open it to you, Bert. and can I just add to that? I think it's probably worth a, a longer discussion, and you know, in two minutes, I don't think we're going to be able to answer some of the questions you have, and to really be able to provide the background and the history of what we have provided here. Um, but Ken is spot on. We have a very comprehensive program, so you know, the reading discussions. I've been in education for thirty years; they've been going on for that long, and if not longer, you know, it's not, it's not one or the other. It's a comprehensive program. Yeah, I, I saw that article in the Times and it had just talked about teachers college and like bringing back phonics. And I know that we do phonics work. Um, I didn't know if that was in addition to what the teachers college program was. So, you know, this update or push mm -hmm. towards phonics, maybe it's not such a big deal for us. I was just it's you know, just not. And you're, you are exactly spot on. We have always had a phonics um, component to our day. It's a very uh, systematic, comprehensive approach to phonics and phonological awareness that starts right in kindergarten. And we've had that since as long as I've been here and probably longer. Um, it, yeah, it, just to add, Laura, that we have uh, in the last meeting, um, we talked about extending our foundations phonics program, a more structured phonics program into our third grade uh, for a couple of reasons. One, due to the pandemic and students needing uh, you know, continuing to learn to read in third grade, right, and to, to support that. But also, um, you know, I, the state of Connecticut's moving in that direction as well, that through grade, grade three, uh, you know, that districts, you know, use uh, as part of their comprehensive program, uh, an approved phonics program. And currently the state, uh, while they haven't come down with this yet, they will be um, identifying um, approved programs at the state level uh, for grades K to three to be to be using. So we're watching that very closely in terms of where that uh, state reading committee comes out. But you know, as Laura said, you have um, you have the phonics, the phonological awareness. You have the spelling, and that's that's where our foundations um, you know program. You know, we we address those those skills. Those are important components uh, that have to be in, in daily instruction, but then also we've got to be working on comprehension and vocabulary um, and fluency. And where that comes in is using other resources um, like our units of study uh, that, that we've used from Teachers College. And in that article, you saw that um, uh, Teachers College is, is, is going to have some newer units of study coming out and that that's something once they do come out in july to take a look at and to see can we you know is there a way to enhance what we have there but um you know if if a district is moving completely towards phonics or completely towards a unit of study where it's just comprehension based that would not be serving kids well you need to address all the different components of literacy and you know, make make tweaks when you need to. And I think with this third grade adjustment next year, uh, you know, building the time in to, to uh, extend in third grade, that's that's really going to help us, especially, you know, for 
for our students. Uh, you know, they need to learn how to read by the end of third grade and to build that in is, is key. Um, we also have a very comprehensive progress monitoring system for students starting right in kindergarten where we look to a very discreet level of skills, application of those skills, comprehension um, throughout the year. So it is, you know, again, it's not, there's not enough time today to go into all that, but um, we look right down to very discreet levels and how students are acquiring skills, acquiring phonological awareness, and then how they then apply those skills to books. Uh, one thing that I just wanted to add is, so going back to the district goals, we have in there as one of the action steps, right, uh, Dr. Groff, phonics training scheduled for this August to expand the foundations program in grade three. That's correct? That's correct. And, and it's not that we we hadn't been using something in third grade. We've, we, you know, we've used words their way, but it, but it was not as structured as we mm -hmm. had liked. And... Mm -hmm. Um, we did figure out how we would address it in, in, in the schedule. Patty Felber working on that. So you, that's when you heard from Alex and you heard from, you know, from the Wiss on that. Um, this, this is another thing I, I wanted to just give a shout out. I don't know how many people are aware of it, but one of the things that um, that um, under Dr. Craw's uh, leadership, we put together this SRBI handbook and it talks a lot about the uh, progress monitoring, the differentiating specifically in the areas of math and reading that it's um, completed that components and it and it also speaks to that and to the approach and the progress monitoring that um, Ms. Caddis uh, referenced. In the district goals update that we're gonna do on uh, Tuesday, it's gonna be brief, but we're in the process of linking, this was actually a suggestion from a parent, um, when we talk about the, the SRBI handbook or this and that in the document, we're going to have all those turned into links. So then people that are interested can actually say, oh, like, let's look at the presentation that Kelly just gave on um, this and that and everything, because there's so much good work. And I think that sometimes if it's not easily and readily available for people to click on, they miss it. Um, and uh, so it's, it's, it's something we're going to work on and, um, so for Tuesday, you'll see that. But this handbook is is really awesome. And it directs, it, it specifically talks to tier one, two, and three in the areas of math and uh, and reading. And we I'm sorry, I did have to get on, on to another meeting, but I look forward to, to a very comprehensive discussion. There's so much great information we can share with you, specifics um, of how we uh, ensure that we meet all those needs across the day. Right, and you'll be seeing, you know, we'll be seeing very soon the outcomes um, from this year for for reading, and you know, using both uh, the Fountas and Pinnell um, K five, the MAP uh, grades two through eight, and the Smarter Balanced assessments, and and some of the preliminary looks at F and P and MAP are, are looking very good, very good. So um, Laura will be able to give a, a further update on that um, at a later date when we have all that information. Sounds okay. good, thank you. All right, thank you. All right, and um, I know, um, you know, we uh, spent a great deal of time at one of the board meetings on the developmental relationships and the drug and alcohol survey information. Uh, there has been follow-up since that meeting in terms of the, the community. We had a rising freshman forum. I know there's been, um, you know, a, a question, uh, which is why we put this on the agenda um, in relation to, you know, some of the, um, you know, the, the at-risk information, at-risk groups, subgroups that we, we looked at. Um, and, uh, you know, I know that, uh, you know, Julie's here, she can also, she can speak to this, but, um, you know, when we looked at the drug and alcohol results, one of the uh, groups that um, uh, stuck out was that the LGBTQ uh, was at a, a, a greater risk of using uh, alcohol and, and other substances. And I know you had some you know, questions about that, and I don't know if you want to frame that here for us. Yeah, sure. Um, I just know we had identified that group as a group that had disproportionately poorer outcomes compared to the general population. And I was just wondering if we had any kind of plan or um, way to address 
the needs of that specific group or to understand the problem that was going on there a little bit better um, and, and how we focused on making sure that we we have this red flag that we're doing something about it. Right. Um, Julie, from the high school standpoint, do you, do you have any um, feedback? Sure. Um, so we have a meeting on the calendar uh, before the end of this school year uh, with the advisors and members of the Western Identity Alliance, um, which is formerly our GSA group. Uh, so a group of student leaders uh, who have this particular subgroup's interests in mind, along with their uh, faculty advisors to sit with administrators and sort of talk about where we are and, and how the school community can support their unique needs. So I am looking forward to that, that conversation. Um, you also may be aware that uh, the Western Identity Alliance is a new stipended position uh, for next school year that was part of the budget to create uh, a stipend for those advisors to really build up that work. So um, we are excited for that. Um, and in addition, we've had conversation uh, with our school counselors and our uh, school counseling personnel about uh, the student groups that we that we form. So you may be aware that um, through the counseling department, there are students who are identified to participate um, uh, on a routine basis in groups. And those groups often have um, specific interests in mind. Sometimes students are grouped, um, you know, there's a ninth grade girls group, or, you know, there's an 11th grade um, co-ed group. So there has been talk amongst the counselors about, you know, should there be, um, uh, should there be a group that is specific to students who have uh, particular concerns or needs uh, in the area of um, gender identity or, um, you know, LGBTQ issues. So I don't know that that will come to pass because, you know, it can be a difficult thing for students to, um, you know, identify with a per certain affinity group, if you will, um, and then to want to talk about that uh, with school personnel. So it's something that we'll continue to talk about um, with our core team going into next year when we're looking at forming those groups. The other thing that I will add is, you know, as we saw from the survey, our students are starting with these sorts of risky behaviors earlier. And so I think it's important that we look at, you know, how we have those same kinds of conversations in the later middle school years and that we are able to uh, perhaps identify those students who may be at risk or who may be struggling so that we can really ensure that they have a, a strong transition from eighth to ninth grade. Um, you know, obviously that is an interest that we have for all students to have a really positive transition from eighth to ninth grade. But certainly, you know, any students that are at risk or requiring any additional support, we would want to know who they are um, right off the bat so that we can reach out to them so that we can develop connections early on. Um, so, so those are sort of the big things that I would say are on the horizon is really looking at transition from eighth to ninth grade. Who are the students that we need to uh, reach out to right away? Um, that meeting that's on the calendar with the Western Identity Alliance. And then this notion of uh, affinity group slash counseling group uh, for this subgroup of students. Ken, I don't know if you have anything you wanted to add. Yeah, no, I think I think that's that's very helpful, um, you know, as an update. And I think you know our you know obviously sharing all that information with our counselors, um, you know, prior to that board meeting was was important, mm -hmm. um, and that continued that continued focus uh, is critical. Patty, um, Ju I don't know if I missed this or not, but I, I think there might be an opportunity here at the middle school to have a similar group, um, which may have, I think it would be really beneficial for those two groups to connect. Um, so we've been talking about that here as well. We have incorporated um, more important resources into the health program. So I'm hoping that helps a little bit too. So our goal is for students to um, 
have the resources they need and more importantly to be able to advocate for themselves um, when they need to of where to go for support or help or connections etc so i um, hoping that makes a difference but i i am really an advocate that there should be some kind of group here as well um, that does coordinate with the high school so if in those conversations something like that comes up i'd be more than happy to to step in and be a liaison there yeah. and um patty just uh, more generally from drug and alcohol standpoint we have plans this summer uh to to look more closely in in the fifth sixth seventh grade curricula um you know to to look at those lessons and augment what we're we're, we're doing because of that uh, uptick in the middle school in, um, in in alcohol use that we saw from three to ten percent yes absolutely and you know that's pretty easy to do we we're planning on um actually not even just at the sorry the things going on here um not just at the uh middle school level but we're looking at grades four and five as well so when Oh, we lost you. We lost you, Patty. Okay. All right. Yeah, we lost you there. Sorry, the thing is going off here. <laughs> All right. Well. So, but I definitely we're we're looking at improving or incorporating more in grades four and five, not just at the middle school, and also, um, I, you know, looking at the data. I'm I'm hoping that that might be a blip in the data and not like a, a trend that's going to continue. And because all of the other areas looked really pretty promising and I was pretty pleased with them. So it is that that was a concerning number, though. So uh, I think it's pretty easy to um, a address that here and incorporate more. And I'm very, very much an advocate of uh, parent connections. And I, I found even with those surveys, like the more students feel that their parents are um, not in favor or an advocate against alcohol use or experimentation, the, the more likely they are not to experiment or mm -hmm. to delay the experimentation. So that's a big indicator for us that these parent connections are really important. And I, I'd like to make sure that, that those get expanded you know, across the district. That's a great point, Patty, that this notion of parent perception um, around substance use is, is hugely uh, influential for students in, in terms of whether they will uh, begin to experiment with substances. Um, I just want to mention, since you brought up the parent perspective, we did bring back the Rising Freshman Forum this year. That was for all eighth graders and uh, an accompanying a parent or guardian, and we had that at the beginning of May, um, which included some guest speakers and a question and answer session and a variety of resources that were provided uh, in a packet to families, um, just kind of trying to help them figure out how to talk about some of these things with their students, uh, to give them some sense of you know, what the survey said here in Weston so that they, you know, had some awareness around, you know, what it is that we're, we're really talking about and dealing with. Um, it was very well attended. There is a makeup session. Um, Mr. Doak is, is holding a makeup session, I believe, on the last day of school for students and families who could not attend. So the goal there was to get to everyone uh, just before that transition to ninth grade. Um, and as part of that program, we did do a parent survey just to ask in general about parent programming and what are some things that would be helpful for parents to see at the high school level in terms of parent programming. Um, so that was really helpful to us and we'll be looking at that uh, as well going forward. And I will note that that program was um, in conjunction with ADAP um, and Sonia Stack was very influential in helping us to bring that back. And Dan and I met with Sonia um, you know, uh, it, earlier in the spring and talked not only about the Rising Freshman Forum, but about how we bring back um, guest speakers and assemblies and things into the buildings now that we're able to do that. So I think going into next year, this will be a topic of conversation, not only as part of the health curriculum, but also just in general for, um, you know, the school community. 
Ken, I have a quick question, which I think would links back to what Julia was talking about earlier and, and Bernadette. I brought up at the uh, regular BOE meeting when we were looking at the, eight, uh, the ADP or the, the ADAP results, and LGBTQ was uh, essentially the identified underrepresented group, but they're not the only underrepresented group. So I just want to make sure that, um, you know, as resources are put on looking at the LGBT community and why there appears to be an increased risk within that group, we're not, look, we're not, not looking at other groups that might not have identified as high, because it seems like one of the um, themes of Weston is, you know, to every, lift everybody up, right? And that if someone is struggling, give them the help that they need. So I just wanna make sure we don't wind up with a little too much, uh, uh, tunnel vision, that there may be other groups uh, that did not re get represented. And it's possible even in talking to LBGT community, there might be similarities or things that they were willing to come forward and share with on the survey that could be applied to other groups. So I'm just asking that it seems like there's some resources that are going to be put uh, at digging deeper into that particular group. Um, but we should not uh, be only looking at that group and we should be looking for things that uh, might uh, that group might be more open or vocal about their use and their feelings whereas other groups may say you know or there may be other risk at risk groups that did not share that information right and you know in, in, in the survey uh, you know was a certain set of questions and it provided the information we have and we're reacting to that um, but you know the, of course there could be um, you know, whether it's groups or just individuals too, that just need support. And I think that piece is really key is, and Weston does this so well, working with individual families and students. Um, yeah. And, and, and that's kind we, of the one-on-one -on -one that we always talk about in absolutely. Weston and the resources that we put to our administrators, to students, to teachers. It's the teachers literally know your child's name as it walked in the door and they have intimate knowledge about how they're doing on a day-to-day -day basis. So um, we should be leveraging that as well. And I agree with you 100%, Ken. There could be individuals, not even a group. A subset that is so small, it winds up being a handful of individuals, but we want everyone to be successful, you know, not not small groups. Right. So, yeah. Exactly. I just want to make sure that we were looking at it holistically in a global Yeah, and you know, way. whenever there's, you know, look, and, and, and um, uh, you know, if if someone is uh, you, you know using uh, under the influence, uh, th those are also signals to us. You know, as part of the disciplinary process with that, if uh, you know if it gets you know gets to that point, and we we you know someone has you know been experimenting to the point where they may be uh, under the influence on campus, and then you know we address that. There is a huge educational component, uh, health component that we, you know, <clears throat> route we go down with, with the families to make sure that student is getting support. Okay, um, I guess uh, we have one more agenda item and I uh, framed it as update on a healthy learning environment. And it was within the context of, um, you know, there obviously was the uh, the school shooting in Uvalde, Texas, and you know uh, there were questions. You know how how are how are students doing in general? Uh, you know in Weston and in, in, in dealing with that news, and then also in the backdrop of other shootings. Um, and we know <clears throat> historically uh, during the, the the Parkland shooting, we did have a large number of students who um, protested on the high school football field and we you know helped manage that and give them a um, you know an opportunity to 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 speak uh, in a safe environment and then this past oh well gosh uh, Julie help me what day was it it was probably um, two weeks ago uh, what was it about a about a hundred it was a much smaller group uh, that that came out uh, around noontime about a hundred students uh, that, that protests. And I think Julie can probably give uh, some background mm -hmm. on this and, and how students are responding. Sure. Um, 
So, so each time something like this happens, um, you know, there's a there's a balance that has to be struck between, um, you know, trying to ensure that our own procedures support the safety and security of our students and uh, sort of how to help them grapple with this without uh, making it too much of a focus of the day and the conversation. You know, we, we, we're we educators and, and we want to support them, but we also don't want to, you know, tip the balance and, and create additional upset. Um, so, you know, I think the morning after we received the news that this happened, um, I brought our crisis team together, which includes um, our administration and members of our school counseling staff. Um, and we really just had a conversation, you know, how, how do we want to handle this? There have, the fact of the matter is that there have been so many situations like this that we can't possibly recognize them every time they happen. We have to sort of be prepared all the time um, that there is something that's happening in the news that can, uh, can be upsetting or can be a topic that, that students want to bring up um, while they're at school. So uh, as I said, I brought the crisis team together and we had a conversation about how best to uh, move forward and support students and um, you know, acknowledge how they are feeling and, and try to help them move through. The reality is that we're in, in a school community where there are approximately a thousand students and staff members, everybody is going to feel differently. Um, and so we have to just be prepared to meet people where they are. Um, so that morning following the crisis meeting, I made a short statement uh, over the PA. Uh, we did a moment of silence and a short statement um, during which I really primarily reminded students how important it is for them to report if they're concerned about something that, you know, the if you see something, say something piece. Um, and I will say that following that messaging, I think students took it really seriously. Our students always do. They are very good about reporting to us when there is something they're concerned about. But in those days immediately following, we had several students who came down and said, look, you know, I've been thinking about this and here's something that I think I need, I think I need to tell you uh, on a variety of matters, not necessarily on a security front, but just because they, they were you know, that messaging was there. Um, and in each of those cases, they came to the school counseling department and reported to school counselors and those school counselors reported to administration when that was necessary. And all of the pieces, uh, you know, went in the way that they should have. So um, on, on that Thursday, two weeks ago, tomorrow, um, in the morning, we received word that there was a call for a national walkout. Um, and that was very similar to what had happened, as Ken mentioned, um, in 2018, following the, the shooting in Parkland. And so, you know, in those situations, it's very clear in our policies and our handbook, we, we don't support student protesting. We don't condone student protesting. However, you know, when we have potential for our students uh, in large numbers to be uh, leaving the building. We have a responsibility, particularly in following events like this, to ensure their safety and security. So we provided a space. I met with some student leaders that morning to say, you know, if if you know that kids are going to do this, we encourage you to go out to the football field where we can monitor things, where we can ensure that you are safe. Um, and as Ken said, there were, um, you know, 80 to 100 students who who came out, um, they were quite organized. They, they took a lap of unity. There were some student speakers. Uh, they had an extended moment of silence. And after 20, 25 minutes, they, they came back in. Um, and I think those are moments when I'm very proud because, you know, students chose to participate, students chose not to participate. Um, they exercised their rights to speak about their opinions, and they did it in a very mature and respectful way. And, you know, classes continued while that happened, and, you know, all of the work of the building um, continued. So I, I think notably in response to your question, everyone will have responded differently. And as long as we are prepared to meet those different needs, 
um, we can be successful. So checking in with certain students who we know um, have struggled in the past with events like this, um, and certainly supporting the needs of our student leaders uh, in wanting to organize um, their own thoughts and ideas, uh, I think has been really helpful. So it, it, it's ongoing. I think at this point, just knowing how things are, um, that we need to continue to check in not only on our own safety and security procedures, but in our supports uh, when, you know, the, the work of the crisis team, the supports that we have in place when things like this happen. Right. And uh, there was Lisa's communication um, you know, after the shooting, and then each of the principals followed up with um, uh, resources, um, you know, from the, uh, you know, from, from psychology organization that, you know, tips for parents on how to support students. Yeah. I'm grateful that, for that update. Um, I, I'm sorry. I was going to say, I think all of us parents have been just hugging our kids a little closer this week. And um, every time we get to hear all of the robust systems we have in place and all of the good works that you're doing to take care of the kids, not only grateful, but it helps everybody feel um, a little bit better, and more secure. So thank you. I was just going to ask, I think it was, um, I think his name is Eric Torres. Is he the SIL for social? Uh, Nick. 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 Torres. Okay. Yeah. All right. Um, so we had a discussion at the curriculum meeting about bringing some current events into the classroom for discussion. So when the students have an opportunity to go out and um, go onto the field and, you know, use that time, is there a connection uh, with their ability to do that with uh, a discussing the current event in a more educational forum mm -hmm. back in the classroom? Is that our uh, provisions made where, you know, the, something happens and then, you know, they there's an opportunity to bring it into the classroom or is it just student organized happens out on the field and then they go back into the uh, school and it's business as usual? Mm -hmm. I think I think naturally opportunities arise to have discussions in the classroom that are educational in nature, that are related to the curriculum or the current unit. I, there is not, to your question, um, a singular formal opportunity that is made um, to talk about it, say, in every classroom. And I think, you know, with situations like this, it can be very challenging for teachers to have these kinds of discussions in the classroom. And certainly, you know, those who would be uh, facilitating discussions I, the social studies classroom is the natural link, right? Um, but at the same time, there um, there are, as we've just acknowledged, some students who really struggle with these kinds of situations on an emotional level. There are um, staff members who really struggle with these kinds of conversations on an emotional level. You know, we have a, a lot of staff members who uh, live in Newtown. Um, Patty and I are among them. Um, and, you know, that in particular can be a, a, a very challenging uh, topic of conversation for some of our staff. There are obviously political issues that are at hand here. And so when these conversations, when these events, I guess I would say, arise, yes, there are natural opportunities for conversation. What we try to do is ensure that those conversations are again, instructional in nature, linked to the curriculum, and facilitated in a way that support exchange of ideas without making the conversation political in nature or, uh, you know, purely about, uh, you know, safety or security things, right? So again, it, it leads back to that. It's a balance. Um, and I think it would be very hard as a school to say, everybody in a social studies classroom needs to talk about this um, because if we were going to do that certainly we would want to have you know certain talking points a, a clear lesson plan um, and sometimes it just doesn't work that way in a high school you know a kid's going to raise his hand and you never know what he's going to say and you have to sort of be prepared to meet that so i know i know for a fact that this event prompted conversation in many classes though uh, the path of that conversation may have differed depending on the level, depending on the course. 
Well, well, well stated, Julie. Appreciate that. <clears throat> Okay, so it's uh, it's ten thirty, and I th I've I think we've covered our agenda items here, and we just uh, we do have the minutes, Bernie, to approve. Yep. So, Dave, if I could have a motion to approve the April and May twenty twenty two curriculum committee minutes. Yeah, you want me to make that motion? <laughs> or are you making the motion? You want me to? Um. Well, can you make it? Or I think yeah. I think you have to make it, right? Yeah, I think so. Uh, move that the curriculum committee approve the April and May 2022 minutes. All in favor? Aye. Aye. Okay, so the minutes are approved. And I think that's it. There's nothing else. So motion to adjourn? Yes. Sure, <laughs> Appreciate it. Okay, thank right. you so much. Good afternoon. Bye-bye. Bye. Have a great day, everyone. Yep.